Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. So today there's this um, city in Jerusalem, or nearby Jerusalem, called Matzah, that they've been ex excavating for a while. And it's like this uh, network, this network of villages or settlements, and they're calling it a, a mega site. Basically, a bunch of uh, evidence came out that they had a network of a bar this bartering system they, in which thing, imported goods from other regions uh, were brought to uh, the area of, of uh, what's nearby Israel. And let me pull up a map here, uh, right here. So this is a Tel Matza archeological site. I did a video on this probably like six months ago or something like that about this uh, dig. And um, at that time they, they had unearthed some stuff that had a uh, red plaster on the flooring and uh, whenever it gets wet, it would turn like a bright red. And they were speculating that that was more than likely uh, some sort of hallowed uh, building, so such as a temple or like a ritual site or something like that. And they had found a few of those. And they had also found um, that they buried their dead in their homes, underneath their homes, which was common in those days. So, um, and again, the site goes way back. It's around the level of Chital Hoyuk and, and Kobekli Tepes 9,000 years ago at the very least. So it's very interesting that back then there was this bartering system now because again, they had found stuff like obsidian knives. Well, anyway, let's just get into it. So this, this place must have had inhabitants numbering between 1,500 to 3,000 inhabitants 9,000 years ago. They found some stuff in the Jerusalem foothills. So if you look at the, the geography around here, is super mountainous and stuff. So that's where all these caves are um, with uh, these different, what, what you would call um, like pottery and, and tablets and stuff like that, all in this weird, vast network of caves in the foothills. At the site of Matza, they found, uh, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. I'm just gonna call it Matza. Um, obsidian blade that came from Anatolia. So again, that's Turkey. And if you look at the map, Turkey's up here. And you can see how far it is back in those days, too. That's quite a walk. And we'll get into the theory about how it got there later. Um, th the guy kind of goes into it. Um, I forget his name. Kali Kalili. They found other things that they found was a, a thin walled bowl made of serpentine stone, which originated in northern Syria. And then large alabaster beads made in ancient Egypt, among some other things as well. Uh, it was really interesting uh, that they found all this stuff. And I kind of hinted on, at it uh, because it, it's not like this came out of the blue. This was discussed as well that they were part of some sort of network of uh, trade and, and some sort of commerce was going on and an exchange was going on throughout this entire region. When I was on the Grimerica show, I talked about uh, Doggerland. And in the episode that I did about Doggerland about like three or four months ago, I talked about how uh, they found very similar things. They found tools and weapons and stuff stuff that wasn't native to Doggerland and that came from the surrounding region. And I was talking about how, well, they must have, that's indicative of a, a, some sort of trade system, some sort of exchange system. And you're seeing that in action here. Anyway, um, another thing they found was a pierced pendant bead on a female body, which was made of mother of pearl, which came from the Red Sea. So if we look at that, the Red Sea is down here, very south of this map. Uh, yeah, you can see it better in this map here. And again, you see this entire area was connect interconnected economically as well as religiously and genetically and all that other stuff. And this is a doctor, Dr. Hamoudi Kalali. Kalali, Kalali. Um, so on that same body, they found the bracelet made of stone and it, it was broken and repaired back in that day. That's very interesting that they had that. Um, like that was a thing and they found uh, evidence for that. The two ends of each bracelet fragments had paired holes, meaning the three pieces could all be tied together. Uh, the mortars used to grind out is uh, made of uh, a basalt rock, and it d that doesn't exist in Jerusalem foothills. The nearest source is the Golan Heights. So again, um, that's that's pretty interesting stuff that they were um, again connected and tra trading, and to the point where they're finding it in abundance and it goes back 9,000 years. That's, um, that's very rare, uh, to find anything that of any amount that old. So th it must've been super prevalent back in the day. Anyway, uh, we do not know if or how people sailed 9,000 years ago. They're pretty sure that they did though. Um, I don't know about the if part. 
so the, this is where he goes to the explanation of how the exotic items reached uh, the Neolithic city of Matza. And they don't think that it was early traders setting out on long distances, like kind of like the Silk Road, like the express purpose of, of trading. He thinks it was um, through this process called diffusion. So um, basically, for example, the obsidian blade um, had probably been made where it was found in Turkey because that's where a lot of obsidian uh, stuff was made from passed from community to community and from hand to hand around the Mediterranean basin until ultimately reaching this town. So the, this process of diffusion is indicative of a, of a bunch of stuff. One, people were passing freely between their borders to a certain extent, it seems like. So this free exchange of ideas wasn't like their way of life must have been much different than we imagine it would be. Uh, because again, this process of diffusion, uh, assumes a few things uh, such as uh, this idea of I guess you would say open borders or something like that and this um, this entire region as one community more or less otherwise how would it pass down from hand to hand around the Mediterranean basin if we had a bunch of different people living here and they had their own nations and there were out, like some like there would have been public public relations would have been a much bigger thing and a much bigger deal so it must have been akin to something like uh, a pastoralist uh, existence uh, region-wide. So in support of the diffusion thesis, the closer one gets to the source of obsidian, the more such pieces and waste from obsidian tool making one finds. Obviously, if this is a source, if there's a mountain source of obsidian, you'll find most of the items built somewhere in the settlements around that natural resource. So that's what um, he's saying, and then they just sort of spread out from from uh, from there into the surrounding regions and the neighboring regions. The heavy-duty basalt mortars also probably reached the Jerusalem Hills by process of diffusion as well, as they pass from generation to generation, and they use it as barter. Um, they might trade beads from uh, from Egypt with obsidian from Turkey and or Anatolia, and that's probably those kinds of opportunities and th those interactions probably occurred throughout the millennia between the end of the ice age up until um, the fall of matza and when the society collapsed back the first societal collapse back then uh, the villagers did have a type of glue viscous bitumen i did a ep episode on this like a year ago um uh, neanderthals were using some form of this as well uh, they think this came from far away specifically the dead sea area and again, traces of bitumen were found on the obsidian blade. It had been used to glue the blade to its handle, which probably had been made of bone. So again, you see um, all these different ingredients or uh, components come together from uh, originally from uh, separate regions, and they're all coming together in like everyday use items all throughout the region. So again, that kind of indicates a, a certain prolonged period in which this was going on, because it couldn't have happened for only about. 50 years and then suddenly uh, they disappeared. It wouldn't have happened like that. This diffusion hypothesis again um, s supposes that there w was a long, largely uninterrupted period of free exchange without uh, any a huge uh, conflict or insofar as a conflict big enough to uh, slow that free exchange down. At least there's no sign of that. Um, it began around 10,500 years ago, uh, the city of Matza and its peak in the 8th millennium BC. It featured gathering places, public buildings, and densely crowded homes. So again, indicative of um, a lot of a, a dense population, obviously, and a lot of children as well, because most of the skeletons they find are of children. Because again, when you have uh, population density, you have a lot of food, you have abundance, you have a lot of children. And if you have a lot of children, there's going to be a lot of those children who wouldn't make it there'd be a high infant mortality rate and so uh that's why we have a larger amount of uh, stone or uh children bones and uh, remains from this time more than any other i think the oldest person they have is is like 62 so there were elders for sure it's not like everyone died when they were 30. um Chitalhuyuk, turkey archaeologists are confident that the residents of another 9,000 year old town entered and exited their extremely crowded houses through the roof with the help of ladders because the houses are so dense that there's no other option 
Um, so yeah, in Tall Huyuk, that they, their entrances were were more varied than the ones in in ancient Jerusalem. Streets going back 9,000 years were cut between the houses, which were made of mud brick that has long since disintegrated. This uh, visual reminded me of the ancient Maya too. Um, the way that their uh, streets were planned were very similar to how uh, they are in, in Jerusalem and the Matzah site. Uh, the construction foundations made of large stone bricks can still be seen. The structure towns max of order, which is, uh, suggests city planning. And again, um, there were leaders of the settlements that planned the, the city's development. Um, and that does make sense. Obviously, you can't get anything large scale done without the use of language and mass scale directions and and uh, some some centralization of power, meaning like the leaders had um, a loose sense of power in the sense that people listen to the leaders. So whatever they said likely would happen. And if they wanted to develop the city, that's what would have happened. Um, the ancients evidently had grain put away for a rainy day. So they knew how to, they found grain silos. Um, agriculture was already in full sway by the time the, the settlement arose. So agriculture was not a new thing. It, there, there had been traditions already. I um, mean, you can see that that their relig their temples are kind of a byproduct of that because once you have agriculture down then you can focus on living a good life and start thinking about more of the abstract like uh, the number one thing would be life after death and so they had these burials and again um, you, agriculture again was around long enough so that these people could have developed culturally in the abstract because again think of it as like a needs pyramid right they had their their most primitive needs uh, pretty much covered day in and day out. They had to work for it, but they also had time to really think and develop in another direction as well. So again, it does make sense that agriculture was in full sway and that hints at some sort of, again, leftover culture, whatever you want to say from the Pleistocene. Um, there were people living in the Pleistocene as well, and you have to assume that they had their own cultures, they had their own values, they had their own de developmental path before uh, the Younger Dryas boundary, which essentially, again, cut off the head of humanity. If you want to think of uh, society as a whole back then in the Pleistocene, it completely changed the direction of their lifestyle and how their people developed. And because of that, um, maybe agriculture was an aspect of the past that survived into the Holocene uh, or uh, this this era of this Neolithic era that we're talking about. The first stab that cultivation began as long as 23,000 years ago. So again, that's well into the Pleistocene. That's beyond the last glacial or the, yeah, the, the, the glacial maximum. Um, very interesting stuff. Uh, the villagers had settled down into sedentary subsistence farming lifestyles. And so that means at least for thousands of years they were already living this way they were growing wheat barley legumes broad beans chickpeas so they were making hummus back then um and they and they know that they were grinding the chickpeas down along with the beans as well and that's how you make hum that's essentially what hummus is uh you swear analysis of the serrated uh, flint sickle blade show that they were indeed used to cut grain stalks um and here's some of the alabaster beads they found uh that were created in egypt long 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 ago they grew surpluses. They found a silo containing uh, grain. I mentioned that they bartered some of their extra yields for obsidian, volcanic glass, gorgeous beads, and so on. So again, they have, they were in, they had surplus. They were in a, a society, a culture of excess. So whatever excess they had, they would use it as trading chips, and they would get other goods. And that this idea was probably a well, it was around long enough to where it worked for them, and the, and it happened, uh, and I don't at the very least a region-wide uh, rate at a region-wide scale so um, they even had domestic goats which they're saying that was it was an innovation of its time um, but again uh, they had to learn how to do that somewhere so maybe that tradition of domestication is just like agriculture some sort of uh, ideological or or technical remnant of the past uh, something that's so fundamental that uh, the people who passed on uh, ideas, such, a, such like the people from Gobekli Tepe, maybe uh, they recognize agriculture and domestication as two things that are important enough to write down in stone and pass on to um, the, the next generation, so to speak, the surviving generation. 
Um, crops and animals are domesticated in different times and places. Genetic al analysis has suggested that the goat was the first to be domesticated from the Bazaar in central Persia around 11,000 years ago. And then it had the goat had been um, it's speculated anyway that the goat had been domesticated and re-domesticated. Same thing with the pig. Um, and then the uh, he, apparently, Kalili says there's a smoking bun. Uh, uh, bun a smoking. Kalili says there's a smoking gun about the Matsu Neolithic's really the first people. He thinks they were the first people in the area, which I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I agree with him. DNA testing of the goat bone fragments found around the garbage strewn town shows them the, to be the most ancient domestic goat found in the region. It was completely domesticated, not some halfway hybrid. So um, he thinks that domestication is a process that you do with uh, the wild animals around the area and some of them the domestication process works and some some of them it doesn't work on like zebras for example domestication doesn't completely work on them um, and then um, if you were to somehow disappear then the goats according to his theory would eventually go back to being wild again so and from his uh, from his point of view since the people of Matza had goats that were fully domesticated already, they had already gone through that long process of domestication. He's saying, wow, these people must have been here long enough to do that. So they must be the first. Now, I don't think that, I think that claim that they were the first, maybe the first since um, go back, uh, since the Younger Giants boundary, maybe, but really, if you can't really tell because there are people who they found in the area 285,000 years ago and so on. So, um, yeah, uh, but I don't, I don't, maybe this is just a contextual thing, I don't know, but um, he must be aware of those old skeletons. I'll just uh, give him the benefit of the doubt, I guess. Uh, the town also featured domestic cows and pigs, these people living around 6,000 years before Judaism with this revulsion for the swine would start to develop them. So yeah, so people were eating pigs and shellfish and stuff back then, and it wasn't until Judaism that um, they started to uh, put a prohibition on those things. It's very interesting. Um, and also the pigs, again, they were domesticated several times in their history, even in China around 9,000 years ago, um, concurrent with the Levant area. So that's very interesting. That's peculiar. That, again, adds credence to the fact that, or to the theory anyway, if you want the speculation, the idea that um, domestication was some, was some sort of just like starting a fire, just like agriculture, just like cultivation was a skill that you could use to, in a subsistence culture. If you were to start one, if you were to participate in one, um, it seems like they were aware of at least that much of that and the astronomy. So again, um, the way that they lived their lives, would it's very, very difficult to even try to put yourself in their shoes just because we really don't know what they valued uh, because all we have is just some remnants, right? We really have no idea what their state of mind was on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Kalili says that the use wear analysis indicates that at least one was used to manually pound or grind tough meat. Oh, he's talking about um, the mortars made of basalt rock. So again, we have this technology from outside the region imported into into the region of Matza, and they're using it to, to grind down meat, usually for children and the elderly who you know have issue, who are don't have teeth it was like almost baby food so again um they find a bunch of i already uh, mentioned that uh here's the here's one of the excavation sites here pretty interesting stuff um again there's so much out there in jerusalem that there's not enough people to work fast even though there seems like every month something new is coming out like groundbreaking new um, and weekly something new happens, but again, there's so much stuff out there that it's hard to keep up. Um, they don't have enough bodies out there to do all the work. Cause this is a lot of work digging all this stuff up. I mean, that takes a while and it takes a lot of manpower and resources. So, um, um, yeah, but still it's surprisingly fast with the amount of people they have. So if you guys want to go volunteer, you should definitely go check that out. I'm sure that they're taking volunteers. Um, so archaeologists found anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figurines. This is one of them. This is like an ox, an ox or a dog, depending on how you look at it. And here's another picture of the dig site. Um, yeah, it looks like they're farming something, but really th that's just a dig site here that they just uh, separate everything into squares. 
um, yeah, so they find all these different um, uh, zo these these figurines that that are anthropomorphic and also just uh, zoomorphic as well with just the animal. And they they've had one um, not the lion man that was Germany, but they had one similar. They even had pottery that was from Turkey and, and parts of Asia as well that were created differently than the way that they did, which um, they didn't have kilns of fire and clay. They were just uh, sun-baked, so it makes a very different, um, almost unusable type of pottery. So they had distinct different pottery in there. Um, they, I already talked about the plaster on the ground, uh, maybe some type of temp uh, temple. They found... Um, they did use wear analysis on really small flint arrowheads that were coated with uh, with poison. So again, they had poison technology as well. Uh, no signs of violence were found on any of the bodies. Um, and one of the theories that uh, their settlement petered out was their early farming practices may have depleted the soil. Uh, they weren't doing uh, crop rotation. Maybe that, that could be understandable if you're if, if essentially your origins are of these people who survived this cataclysmic event, this global cataclysmic event, and you had to relearn, you had to scramble to relearn agriculture, maybe um, crop rotation just slipped through the cracks and they had to l uh, learn that the hard way. That could easily be true. Um, or maybe a disease or something killed them, but there's no sign of that. So again, um, it, the, the jury's still out in terms of why um, they're, their settlement was no longer sustainable, but that's a pretty interesting, um, uh, that's a pretty interesting theory that their early farming practices depleted the soil and they didn't know what to do about it. Um, again, also they, they think that trash might have built up because they did find a lot of trash. I did an episode about that in Chitalhuyuk. They found a bunch of trash there and they were living with domesticated animals as well they're assuming that if they shared water sources with their domesticated animals and that would have been that w would have been terrible for their hygiene and uh would have been breeding grounds for bacteria and viruses and, and stuff like that anyway uh, let me know what you guys think about this area um at this time again nine thousand years is really old that this is amongst one of the oldest communities uh in the holocene epoch so uh, let me know what you guys think and i'll talk to you guys later